Prabhupads Polemik Ein Artikel von E. Kanat The Guru, Mayavadis and Women Tracing the origins of selected polemical statements in the work of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, E. Kanat Das The Position of the Guru In the purports of Bhaktivedanta Swami's Bhagavad Gita alone, There are 138 statements about the spiritual master, but only 24 of the cases did an earlier commentator refer to an equivalent word or concept. Footnote 16 In his purports to the second book of the Bhagavad Purana, footnote 17, Bhaktivedanta Swami makes 141 statements about the position and importance of the Guru, but only seven of those statements can be linked to the commentaries on which his work is based. Footnote 18. The topic is clearly important to him. If the data from the Gita and the second book are representative Perhaps 89% of what he writes about the spiritual master's position and qualifications is not based on statements that earlier commentators made in the same context. Given this unpredicted emphasis, it seems useful to consider how Bhaktivedanta Swami understood the role of the guru. He especially emphasizes how a person without a guru cannot know God. Only Lord Krishna or his bona fide representative, the spiritual master, can release the conditioned soul. Footnote 19 For one who does not take personal training under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, it is impossible to even begin to understand Krishna. Footnote 20 Unless one is in touch with a realized spiritual master, he cannot actually realize the real nature of self. Footnote 21 Time and again, Bhaktivedanta Swami also insists that the spiritual master be bona fide. A bona fide spiritual master does not mention anything not mentioned the authorized scriptures. Footnote 22 The bona fide spiritual master is he who has received the mercy of his guru, who in turn is bona fide because he has received the mercy of his guru. Footnote 23 I am successful in my teaching work because I have not deviated one inch from my spiritual master's instruction. Footnote 24 Moreover, he frequently states that to be bona fide, the guru must be situated in this disciplic su succession, guru parampara. In the introduction to his Bhagavad Gita, in his purports, and letters to his disciples, he lists the names the gurus in the disciplic succession beginning with Krishna and ending with himself. Elsewhere, Bhaktivedanta Swami repeatedly speaks about the guru's role as an educator. Hence the name Gurukul, House of the Guru, which he gave to network of bordering schools he created for ISKCON children. Everyone, and especially the Brahmin and Kshatriya, was trained in the transcendental art under the care of the spiritual master far away from home, in the status of Brahmacharya. Footnote 25 Children at the age of five are sent to the Gurukula or the place of the spiritual master, and the master trains the young boys in the strict discipline of becoming brahmacharis. 
Footnote 26. As soon as the children are a little grown up, they are sent to our Gurukul school in Dallas, Texas, where they are trained to become fully Krishna conscious devotees. Footnote 27. Bhaktivedanta Swami also advises the Guru's role as family instructor. Any member of the family who is above 12 years of age should be initiated by a bona fide spiritual master and all the members of the household should be engaged in the daily service of the Lord beginning from morning 4 a.m. till night 10 p.m. Footnote 28 Perhaps the most important mission of the Guru judging by the extent to which Bhaktivedanta Swami dwells on this topic is to teach men about women and sex. Footnote 29 During the first stage of life, up to 25 years of age, a man may be trained as a brahmachari under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master just to understand that women is the real binding force in material existence. Footnote 30. His interpretation of Bhagavad Purana 7.12.1 illustrates that according to him the Guru exerts complete control over his married male disciples' sexual activities. If the spiritual master's orders allow a Grihastha to engage in sex life at a particular time, then the Grihastha may do so. Otherwise, if the spiritual master orders against it, the Grihastha should abstain. The Grihastha must obtain permission from the spiritual master to observe the ritualistic ceremony of Garbadana Samskara. Then he may approach his wife to beget children, otherwise not. A Brahmin generally remains a Brahmachari throughout his entire life. But also some Bra Brahmins become Krihastas and indulge in sex, sex life. They do so under the complete control of the spiritual master. Footnote 31 None of their earlier commentators, footnote 32, has explained that Bhagavad Purana passage in this way. In fact, both Bhaktivedanta Saraswati and Ganga Sahaya took the word Guru in this verse to refer to family elders who advise the newly married boy about the proper time to begetting offspring. Lecturing about the same topic before disciples in Bombay in 1976, Bhaktivedanta Swami claimed that Vira Rakava Acharya, a 14th century Bhagavad commentator, had expressed equal strong views regarding guru, sex and householders. If a married man sticks to one wife and before sex, if he takes permission from his spiritual master, then he is brahmachari, not whimsically. Then the spiritual master orders him that now you can beget a child. Then he is brahmachari. Srila Vira Raghava Acharya, he has described in his comments that there are two kinds of brahmachari. One brahmachari is naishtik brahmachari. He does not marry. And another is brahmachari. Also he marries. He is fully under control of the spiritual master, even for sex. He is also brahmachari. Footnote 33. However, the Sanskrit commentary Bhaktivedanta Swami refers to does not state that a married man remains fully under control of the spiritual master. That commentary just names 
the two classes of celibate students and explains that before one becomes a householder, anukorit, sannyasin, or even a lifelong celibate, one is known as upakurvanaka, a celibate who still has an op option to marry. Footnote 34. For these and other statements that Bhaktivedanta Swami makes about the Guru, it appears that he envisions the Master as an all-knowing, all-competent spiritual autocrat, a person without whose mercy the devotee is doomed, who is beyond criticism and who exercises total control over the lives of his disciples. Bhaktivedanta Swami's statements about the position of the spiritual master take on special relevance since in matters of epistemological conflict his views are deemed ultimate even over scripture, the traditional source of highest authority. See Conrad Joseph's essay in his volume. Mayavadis Another topic that received extensive coverage in Bhaktivedanta Swami's writings is what he calls impersonalism or Mayavad philosophy. It is, however, not so much the philosophy he dis discusses, but rather its proponents, the Mayavadins, or impersonalists, as he calls them. He frequently describes them as foolish, less intelligent or ignorant. The self-centered impersonalists, by their gross ignorance, accept the Lord as one of them. Footnote 35 The foolish impersonalists still maintain that the Lord is formless. Footnote 36 The less intelligent impersonalists cannot see the Supreme. Footnote 37 In his purports to the Bhagavad Purana, Bhaktivedanta Swami makes more than 600 statements regarding Mayavadins and impersonalists. None of the 402 statements that are found in the purports to the second, third and fourth books alone, which were examined for this essay, nor any of the 85 statements he makes about impersonalists and Mayavadis in his Bhagavad Gita can be traced back to the earlier commentaries in the tradition. While none of Bhaktivedanta Swami's statements about impersonalists in the above-mentioned sources can be traced to the source he worked from, it can be shown that many of these statements were his passionate responses to expressions he found in the English source material on which his translations were based. For example, in his purports to Bhagavad Gita, 8.3, he states, Impersonalist commentators on the Bhagavad Gita unreasonably assume that Brahman takes the form of Jiva in the material world, and to substantiate this, they refer to chapter 15, verse 7 of the Gita. Footnote 38 It was Dr. Radhakrishna who in his edition 1948 of the Gita commented Svabhav, Brahman assumes the form of Jiva, chapter 15, 7, footnote 39. Another example of Bhaktivedanta Swami's dialogue with modern English commentaries on his purport to Bhagavad Gita 9.11. Some of those the right Krishna and who are infected with the Mayabad philosophy quote the following verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam 3.29.21 to prove that Krishna is just an ordinary man. Footnote 40. Again, it is Radha Krishnan who wrote commenting on the same passage from the Gita.
in the Bhagavats 3, 29, 21, the Lord is presented as saying, I am present in all beings as their soul, but ignoring my presence, the mortal makes a display of imagine worship. Footnote 41. Thus Bhaktivedanta Swami, unnamed Mayavadin, turns out to be Dr. Radhakrishnan. It is not that Bhaktivedanta Swami was interested in Radhakrishnan work or philosophy, but he apparently considered Radhakrishnan's English Gita as useful help in his own translation work. This is documented in the following passage from Hayagrivada's book, The Hare Krishna Explosion, footnote 42. Swamiji finally tires of my consulting him about Bhagavad Gita verses. Just copy the verses from some other translation, he tells me, discarding the whole matter with a wave of his hand. The verses aren't important. There are so many translations, more or less accurate. And the Sanskrit is always there. It is my purports that are important. Concentrate on the purports. There are so many nonsense purports like Radhakrishnan's and Gandhi's and Nikelananda's. What is lacking are these Vaishnava purports in the preaching line of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That is what it's lacking in English. That is what it's lacking in the world. I can't just copy others, I say. There is no harm, but that's plagiarism. How's that? They are Krishna's words. Krishna's words are clear like the sun. Just these rascal commentators have diverted the meaning by saying not to Krishna. So my purports are saying to Krishna. That is the only difference. The translations of many stanzas in Bhaktivedanta Swami's first edition of Bhagavad Gita seems to have been adapted from Radha Krishnan's English translation. When Bhaktivedanta Swami in his translating work came across passages in that book that he didn't fit his own views, he produced vigorous attacks on certain Mayavadis who always remain unnamed. A similar pattern can be found in the third and fourth books of the Bhagavad Purana. The English translations of many Stanzas in Bhaktivedanta Swami's third book agree verbatim with the corresponding stanzas in the English Gita Press edition by C. L. Goswami and M. A. Sastri. In a letter to a disciple dated 21 December 1967, Bhaktivedanta Swami wrote, Please send me the third canto. English translation of the Srimad Bhagavatam done by the Gita Press. You got these copies from the Gita Press for reference. I want the third canto. Please send as soon as possible. Footnote 43. When one compares the English translations of the stanzas in chapters 14 to 31 in Bhaktivedanta Swami's third book, to those of Gita Press English edition, one finds not only stanzas that have been copied verbatim, but also a substantial number of stanzas that have been modified only slightly. Original translations are rare. By conservative estimation, up to 50% of the English translations in Bhaktivedanta Swami's re edition of the third book were actually copied from the Gita Press edition. Footnote 44. Considering the following expert from a letter that Bhaktivedanta Swami wrote to a disciple 
one wonders why he chose to copy so much of the Gita Press translation if he thought that it was so full of Mayavad philosophy. Gita Press is full of Mayavad philosophy, which says Krishna has no form, but he assumes a form for facility of devo devotional service. This is nonsense. I am just trying to whip out this Mayavad philosophy and you may not therefore order for any more copy of the English Bhagavatam published by the Gita Press. The one which you have got may be kept only for reference on having an understanding of the Mayavad philosophy, which is very dangerous for ordinary persons. Footnote 45 Incidentally, the purports to the third book contain more criticism of May Mayavadins than any other part of Bhaktivedanta Swami's Bhagavad Purana. Apparently, he reacted to Shastri and Goswami's interpretations of certain key terms. For example, in his purports to Bhagavad Purana 3.29.33, he writes, Sometimes Mayavadi philosophers, due to a poor fund of knowledge, define the word Sama Darshanat to mean that a devotee should see himself as one with the sup Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is foolishness. Footnote 46 Sastri and Goswami had indeed translated Sama Darshanat in Bhagavad Purana 3.29.33 as Thus sees no difference between himself and me. Footnote 47 Anti-Mayavadin rhetoric in the purports to the fourth book of the Bhagavad Purana can also be accurately traced back to Sastri and Goswami's interpretation of certain keywords that caused Bhaktivedanta Swami to strongly disagree. For example, in his purport to 4.22.25, he notes, The word Brahmini used in this verse is commented upon by the impersonalists or professional reciters of Bhagavatam, who are mainly advocates of the caste system by demoniac birthright. They say that Brahmini means the impersonal Brahman. Footnote 48 Here too, Sastri and Goswami had rendered Brahmini as the attributeless Brahman. Footnote 49 The same authors, Radhakrishnan, Sastri and Goswami, of whose translations Bhaktivedanta Swami had availed himself, became the targets of his numerous polemical remarks regarding their understanding of spirituality. The large number of statements about Mayavadins that are found in the Bhaktivedanta purports to Gita and the Bhagavad Purana and the type and quality of these statements have no precedent in the works of the earlier Gaudiya commentators. Footnote 50 There is, however, a certain tradition of dispute and debate with Mayavadis that can be seen in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, a chiefly Bengali hagiography of Chaitanya written by Krishnadas Kaviraj in 1615. Bhaktivedanta Saraswati, Bhaktivedanta Swami's guru, had written a Bengali commentary, Anubhasya, on Krishna Das's work, in which he does elaborate on Mayavadis and impersonalists, Buddhists, Tattvavadis, Sahajyas, and others that were considered deviant or inimical to Gaudiya Vaishnavism. 
But these are topics that Krishnadas himself develops in his book. In his commentary on the Bhagavad Purana, however, the same Bhaktivedanta Saraswati rarely mentions Mayavadins. Following the earlier tradition, he keeps closely to the subject of the text under discussion. Gaudiya Vaishnavas consider that the nucleus of the entire Bhagavad and its philosophy is found in four stanzas. Chattu Shloki in the second book of the Bhagavad Purana. Footnote 51 With reference to these four important verses, Bhaktivedanta Swami writes, The impersonal explanation of those four verses in the second canto is nullified herewith. Sridhar Swami also explains in his connection that the same concise form of the Bhagavatam concerns the pastimes of Lord Krishna and was never meant for impersonal indulgence. Footnote 52 Here Bhaktivedanta claims that the famous 14th century author Sridhar Swami wrote in his Bhavarta Deepika commentary to Bhagavad Purana 3.3.13 that the Chatushloki were never meant for impersonal indulgence. In other words, he claims that Shridhar had formulated attacks against Mayavadins that were just as polemical as his own. In fact, Shridhar Swami did not write this. Footnote 53. Never in his entire commentary on the Bhagavad Purana does Sridhar Swami mention impersonal indulgence or Mayavadis, not to speak of condemning the la latter. While it might be argued that this is an isolated example, it has far reaching implications. One wonders why Bhaktivedanta Swami went so far as to tell his readers that Sridhar Swami condemns impersonalist philosophy, when the fact is not only that Sridhar did not do this, but it is he, out of all the Bhagavad commentators, of whom it may be said that he had impersonal leanings. Footnote 54. Could it be that Bhaktivedanta Swami was seeking to invest his statements with the authority of Sridhar Swamins, who is widely respected as the foremost Bhagavad commentator? This question is especially difficult to answer because Bhaktivedanta Swami never worked with competent Sanskrit editors and it is hard to determine to what degree he was aware of such misrepresentations. What is known is that he repeatedly criticized or dismissed many of his disciples who gradually achieved a certain level of proficiency in Sanskrit. Footnote 55 since anti-Mayavad polemics are highly conspicuous in ISKCON discourses, see also K.P. Sinha, a critic of A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Calcutta, 1997, a thorough investigation into what causes Bhaktivedanta Swami to formulate so many aggressive attacks on this group might help create a better understanding of his teachings and his movement. Women and Sex There is, within the Hare Krishna movement, a general awareness that Bhaktivedanta Swami made a large number of controversial statements about women. Some were written statements in his commentaries on the canonical Vaishnava scriptures. Others were spoken statements in his lectures and conversations. 
While there is a general feeling that Bhaktivedanta Swami did not always mention pleasant things about women, an accurate assessment of how much of what he said was favorable and how much was unfavorable has never been presented. A quantitative and qualitative analysis of all statements regarding women that Bhaktivedanta Swami made in his purports to the Bhagavad Gita and in his purports to five chosen books, footnote 56, of the Bhagavad Purana is presented below. Each of his 510 statements has been assigned to one of the following six categories. The analysis further ascertained whether any of the earlier commentators mentioned anything about women within the same scriptural context. 80% of all statements that Bhaktivedanta Swami makes about women in the six works investigated are negative statements, in the sense that they involve restrictions, list bad qualities, group women in socially inferior classes or treat them as sex objects that have to be avoided. The figure of 80% is constituted as follows. 56% of all statements concern women as sex objects. 8% are statements about women's class, status or position. 9% are restrictions that states that women should not be given any freedom. 7% are statements about women having bad qualities. While qualities statements actually comprise 15% of the total, which half of them referring to good qualities, these are only mentioned in connection with specific women who are prominent figures in Hindu mythology, Kunti, Draupadi, Devahuti, Gandhari and Sati. Women in general, in other words, present-day living women, are only mentioned as having bad qualities. For the Bhagavad Gita, there are 7 out of 39 statements about women that can be related to earlier commentaries. For the first book of the Bhagavad Purana, 12 out of 117 can be related for the second book, 4 out of 37 and for the 8th book, 16 out of 52. This means that 80% of Bhaktivedanta Swami's statements about women in the purports to these four titles are his own contributions that do not re represent statements that earlier commentators made in the same context. Reasonably similar results expected for the titles that were not included in this study. While Bhaktivedanta Swami often made generalizing statements regarding Mayavadis, footnote 63, he issued even more such broad generalizations about women. Generally, all women desire material enjoyment. Footnote 64. Women in general should not be trusted. Footnote 65. Women are generally not very intelligent. Footnote 66. It appears that women is a stumbling block for self-realization. Footnote 67. Other statements that are not supported by the earlier commentators are Bhaktivedanta Swami's views on rape. Also, rape is not legally allowed. It is a fact that a woman likes a man who is very expert at rape. Footnote 68. When a husbandless woman is attacked by an aggressive man, she takes his action to be mercy. Footnote 69. Generally, when a woman is attacked by a man, whether her husband or some other man, 
She enjoys their tag being too lusty. Footnote 70. While sexually is a topic that mainly comes when Bhaktivedanta Swami focuses on women, he comments not only on their sexual morals, but also on those of Mayavadins. Anticipates the abominable acts of the Mayavadi impersonalists who place themselves in the position of Krishna and enjoy the company of young girls and women. Footnote 71. In general, he depicts both groups as less intelligent, inferior, sexually incontinent and downright dangerous. In conclusion, then, since the historical and prolonged abuse of women in ISKCON has by now been acknowledged even by the most conversive elements in the movement, see Knots and Mustard's essay in this volume, a more symptomatic analysis of Bhaktivedanta Swami's statements about women and sex might be worth while, leading to a deeper and better understanding of the problem. Iskhan's polemical dismissal of other Hindu groups perceived to expose Mayavadin philosophy, which includes almost every other Hindu group established in the West, is also an inherent part of Iskhan's self-definition and ethos that few would deny. Footnote 72 As Bhaktivedanta Swami was the founder of Iskhan, derogations of Mayavadis and women and sex, coupled with his exaltations of the spiritual master, are not irrelevant to the attitudes demonstrated by his disciples. Since his statements in these areas have no parallel in the writings of his predecessor commentators, one is therefore led search for links in his personal experiences. However, this research and the question of how his views influenced his followers falls under the academic rubrics of sociology or psychology of religion rather than of traditional Sanskrit commentaries ex cases. Bhaktivedanta Swami's statements in the three areas treated here, namely the Guru's position, Mayavadis, and women and sex, are bound to leave a certain impression on his readers. If the frequency of a particular type of statement exceeds a certain magnitude, then the context in which each particular statement appears loses relevance. What remains is the overall impression created by the sheer number of repetitions. In this particular case, that impression might very well be the spiritual master is good, beyond sexuality and superior to all. Mayavadis are dangerous and bad. Women and sex are dangerous and bad. Within the Hare Krishna movement, Bhaktivedanta Swami's purports are considered as good as, in the case of conflict, superior to scripture. History shows that the general mass of his followers indeed imbibed and lived by these ideas he confided. Now notes would follow, but I will not read them because there are too many. Please, if you want to read the notes, visit the web page.